The next show will start in one minute. Live from the Paul and Catherine Ranke Memorial Studio, this is TV Free Baltimore. Support for TV Free Baltimore comes from viewers like you. Become a TV Free Baltimore member by visiting patreon.com slash TV Free Baltimore. Good evening, TV Free Baltimore viewers, and for those that may be joining us for the first time, the following two-hour stream consists of four different shows. The first show is entitled Live from Annapolis featuring Delicate Lauren Aracon. She and I will be discussing the General Assembly's attempt to fund Kerwin. The second show is an interview with former and possibly future Baltimore City Mayor Sheila Dixon on the show Beyond the Streets. The third show in the stream features author Heather Shrevey, who discusses her book, Once a Colonel, on TV Free Baltimore's Books and Authors. Following Books and Authors, local actress Vanessa Meadows appears on The Paul Stefan Show. However, before we begin, we've got breaking news out of Baltimore County. A developer wants to build a 70-unit apartment building in Overly in the 6900 block of Bel Air Road, which is between Willow Avenue and Overly Avenue. A public meeting will be held on Tuesday, March the 10th at 6908 Bel Air Road beginning at 7 p.m. to discuss this situation. Now, we only became aware of this yesterday. I'm going to share with you the flyer that was emailed to me. This was a flyer from the Overly Community Association announcing their meeting on Tuesday, March the 10th at the Natural History Society of Maryland at 6908 Bel Air Road beginning at 7 p.m. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Daniel Cabinets of Alexander Kerr Realty will attend our March OCA meeting to present his proposal for development of 6901 through 6913 Bel Air Road. The block currently occupied by Kay's Pharmacy. Pay attention to that, Kay's Pharmacy. Now, if you go to the Alexander Kerr website to get some information on them, okay. Okay, Alexander Kerr Realty, this is the About tab. You go down here and it says, Alexander Kerr was founded by Gregory Cabinets. Now the former county executive, Kevin Cabinets, has a brother named Gregory. Okay, now remember what Kevin Cabinets did. Now this is an article from the Baltimore Sun. And so Ke under Kevin Cabinet's leadership, the county is going to expand the number of affordable rental homes in prosperous communities from Cockeysville to Catonsville, from Towson to White Marsh. The county, under, again, under Kevin Cabinet's leadership, is to spend $30 million over the next decade to entice developers to build 1,000 homes for low-income African-American families in prosperous county neighborhoods. The county 
also pledged to help 2,000 families from Section 8 rent subsidies to move from poor, predominantly African-American communities, and that's code for Baltimore City, to move to better integrated neighborhoods, which is code for Baltimore County, with stronger schools, lower crime, and minimal clusters. Okay, and if you go to their website under current projects, you will see 6901 through 6913 Bel Air Road. Here's an aerial shot. Okay. I would definitely say that everyone that lives in Overly, Parkville, and even Perry Hall should get out in this meeting, become informed. This could really change the character of the neighborhood. This is a 2.6 billion dollar per year increase in the sales tax. It is a tax on working families. It's a tax on single moms. This is the largest tax increase ever in the history of the state. It would destroy our economy. It's not ever going to happen while I'm governor. I can promise you. Hello, I'm Steve Darnall, the publisher of Nostalgia Digest, and you're watching TV Free Baltimore. Well done. Welcome to another episode of Live from Annapolis featuring Delicate Lauren Aracon. Tonight we're going to talk about Kerwin funding. And for those that may be unaware, the Democrats seek to raise taxes by $4 billion annually to fund the education recommendations spelled out in the Kerwin Commission report. And first I want to begin with talking about the portion of the funding that's going to have to come from Baltimore County. And it's being reported that Baltimore County will need to pay an additional $88.4 million over the next 10 years. And that's on the top of Johnny Oleski's recent Baltimore County tax hikes. So how's the county going to pay? Well, the first question I have for the delegate is, um, will Baltimore County begin to raise taxes by increasing the number of fines residents pay for code violations? For example, the county can fine you up to $500 for not having a lid on your trash cans. So will county inspectors start walking down streets on trash day and passing out $500 fines? Uh, John, and the reason I bring this up is because Johnny Oleski just announced a code force improvement work group. And I wonder if this improvement is really a backdoor way to raise taxes. So, Delegate Eric Hahn, what do you think of um, what I have just brought to the table to talk about? Hey, hey, Charles. Yeah, I think that's totally possible. Um, I would not be surprised if there was some ulterior fundraising motive. Well, the the reason I bring that up is that there was a, uh, I think the Washington Post did it, just did a story about um, the amount of traffic tickets down in D.C. and they said that I think it was $1 million in a, in a certain amount of time, and they said it's predatory. And when Johnny Oleski announced that he's going to put a commission together to fine-tune, you know, the code enforcement, I was like, hmm, yeah. is, is there something going on that we need to bring to the table? Yeah, that certainly, because there, there is really nowhere else I can think of that they're going to be able to raise $88 million a year. Um, I can't imagine how they would be able to do that if they don't, if they don't bring in more violation funds. I, are the violation funds earmarked is the question. I, do they have to be used for something or do they just go into the, sort of the general slush fund? Yeah, th th this I, I have no idea about. Uh, maybe we can get somebody um, from the county council yeah. on one night. But um, And also, there's some chatter on social media that um, Baltimore County residents recently have been going to the Baltimore County landfills and they've had their tags scanned and mm. they've been told that they cannot come to a Baltimore County um, dump more than six times a year and if you come more than six times a year you have to pay a fee so is Baltimore County going to start charging us for services that they provide that we otherwise wouldn't have to pay for wow that's really disappointing I did not know that I had not heard that um, yeah. it's supposed to be a free service for county residents as far as I, I've ever heard. So that's 
I don't know, I guess maybe the council could approve a change like that, or, or maybe there's a rule or a reg that they can change without, well, you know, within a department maybe. I'm not sure. Well, people on social media have said that the law's been on the books for quite some time, but never enforced. And in, uh, my, opinion, in my opinion, rightfully so, because the last thing you want to do is discourage people from taking trash up to the dump, because if people don't take it up to the dump, it's going to just end up in, you know, the local woods or something. I mean, oh, yeah, we already have a problem with dumping. I mean, we have a huge problem with dumping. Yeah, I mean, Baltimore City has a huge problem with illegal dumping, and they're going to bring that to the county if people go to the dump more than six times a year. And now my experience going to the dump is that, um, you know, I have a pickup truck when I go to the dump, but I don't put the, um, the pieces of plywood on the sides and in the front. So people with pickup trucks that have that, they say, okay, we don't think you're doing residential dumping. We're going to charge you. Okay, this I understand. And are are there some people getting away with, you know, make, picking up a little bit of money and just using a regular pickup truck to run to the dump more than six times? Yeah, okay, fine. But, you know, is the cure going to be worse than the disease in this case? Right, and, yeah. And are, I mean, they, are they doing it for alternative motives also? Yeah, that would not surprise me. I mean, I, I, both, I, how will any of these, like, counties that are struggling financially – come up with their portion of the money you know Hartford County is fine they've already they already keep theirs over maintenance of effort significantly so they don't have to put any extra money in but Baltimore County Baltimore City Prince George's County um, I think you know even Montgomery County and Howard County I think have to put you know millions of dollars more in each year um, some of them will be able to do it but I'm not sure how for sure Baltimore City and Baltimore County are going to do it uh, not sure either, but also I wanted to ask you so you can clear it up in my mind. What taxes could the county raise to come up with their portion of the Kerwin bill? I, I, they're already maxed out right on the on the uh, yeah. They, well, they can't right. Well, last time we talked, uh, you clarified it to me and the viewers that the personal income tax 3.2 percent is the highest that Oleski can charge per state right. law. And then he came up with a slew of, he came up with some new taxes and he raised some old taxes. Okay. What's left on the table that he can raise? Because I'm wondering how's the county going to come up with that money? Is there a transfer tax on real estate sales there? Do oh, you guys yeah. have oh, a, oh, yeah. Oh, a yeah. county transfer tax? Mm -hmm. I know we have one in, in Hartford, but I don't, I, I honestly have no idea that, that he may be out of options and that's why we're going to see the code enforcement movement. Yeah. That's really disappointing. Okay, and um, I want to touch on Baltimore City. I don't like to bring Baltimore City too much up on this, um, on your show, because you're from Baltimore County. But we had Sheila Dixon in the studio this week, and she talked about Kerwin. So I want to play this clip of her and uh, get your reaction, because to me, it sounds to me like she's saying exactly what we're saying. So here we go. Here's the clip. We've got a huge ticket item dealing with the Kerwin um, Commission that's going to be, I, I think it's going to be passed um, in this General Assembly. And so we have to make sure that our legislators help us down in Annapolis because the city, if we had to raise 300 and some million dollars, we would have to do a lot of cutting and we have to do a lot of raising of taxes and this is what we can't do. This um, is what we can't do. Right, she's right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, people are fleeing the city. People are paying all these high taxes in their properties. And what are they getting for it? Terrible roads, terrible crime, terrible schools. The air quality is terrible. I mean, dumping everywhere. What are you getting for your taxes down there? And how are they going to increase their tax base by 300 million? I mean, it's just never going to happen. Yeah, well, He's right. Is the city delegation even bringing up the problem that Baltimore City cannot raise their taxes? I mean, people are flying out of the city because of high taxes and high crime. You know, Mayor Young literally said, we're just going to do it. We're just going to, you know, we're just going to figure out how to pay for our portion of Kerwin. I, I imagine that there'll be a waiver of some kind given to them. And then it will it will be the state who pays their portion. That is what I envision well, likely happening. The surrounding counties right. will have to pay more for city schools if they yes. get an exemption on the money that they're supposed to bring to the table to fund Kerwin. Exactly. Which means that the taxes in the surrounding counties are going to have to go up. Yep. 
And this plays right into Johnny Odaleski's plan to adopt regionalism, where the taxes go up around the surrounding counties so the taxes can go down in the city. Yep, that's really scary because people are going to just flee the county too. I mean, I already, I already yeah. left the county because of that, so and that and many other reasons. Yeah, well, Baltimore County had its first population decline last year since the 1930s. Wow. And as we, said on, as we said on the last show, um, you know, Baltimore City's been depopulating for decades. Right. And anybody that wants to say, well, the city's depopulating because racist white people don't want to live with black people, man, you're so out of touch with today. You might as well yeah. go back to 1935. That's so sad, too, because there are real changes that can be made to make people want to live in the city again. But when they're so focused... Um, on only racial causes, you miss the opportunity to fix the other causes. I mean, it's, I would say that's probably a tiny, tiny, if you've already been living in the city, it's not like the demographics changed. I mean, it's always been a blended city. So just disingenuous. And it, and it avoids the real conversations that they don't want to have, which is violent criminals need to stay in jail. Yeah. And they don't want that conversation to happen yeah. because there's already been you know mass incarceration and they don't want any more people to be in jail but some of these people are murderers and they're terrorizing the city has the baltimore county delegation weighed in with their request what they want if they get the money um i don't think they there's anything specific we've asked for i mean we did get funding for building new schools which is good but right. uh for Kerwin specifically, I don't think we've made any any direct asks. Okay. Is there any heat coming from the political left, particularly the um, teachers union? Oh, yeah. I mean, even in the sales tax bill, they conveniently got like labor unions carved out and they got um, teaching related services carved out. So if all the teachers are doing, you know, um, tutoring and things like that. Those services are carved out. They don't get taxed. Oh yeah, they 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 run the they rule the roost out here. Mm. How, how strong is that uh, teachers union? Oh, it's it's the strongest uh, lobby that we have in the state. It, it's stronger than the medical lobby, and the medical lobby is the highest you know employer, the, the highest number of employees in the entire state, and the teachers union is still stronger. And I can tell you why. Why? It, because they are willing to work the polls. They are literally willing to door knock for candidates. And people know that if you have the teachers union, on the left at least, if you have the teachers union on your side, you're way more likely to win your primary because they will actually send warm bodies to help you win. So that's, I mean, that's why the teachers, uh, that's why the speaker's race was so impacted by the unions because when they say, we're gonna primary you, they are going to primary you. Mm, so they can bring boots to the street. Yep. Yeah, when I went over to Towson to listen to the testimony for Johnny Oleski's tax hikes, they were there in force, and I was I bet. shocked. And, and this brings something up. Did you hear the story about um, there was a hearing down there for Kerwin, and the teachers' union went in there hours before and reserved all the seats so none of the opponents could get in? Did you hear about that? I didn't know they did that, but it doesn't surprise me. They they try to do that in Moms Demand Action as well yeah. on gun days. So yeah. usually they fail, but... Well, they reserved the seats, and then whoever was in charge of the committee said, no, you can't do that. It's first come, first seat. You know, get your uh, T-shirts off the chairs. Wow. Yeah. Mm, that's amazing. Yeah. So Probably some false bravado there. <laughs> yeah. They might say that out loud, but at the end of the day... They yeah. have a lot more power than people are willing to accept yeah. sometimes. Okay. Well, um, anything else you want to add about the state trying to fund Kerwin? No, you've pretty much well summed it up. It's a sad state of affairs, and and hopefully this uh, sales tax increase will die. I'm calling it the Kerwin tax now. My yeah. uh, colleague, Mike, Mike Griffith, Delegate Mike Griffith from 35B, came up that he said, let's call it the Kerwin tax because that's what it really is. I said... That is totally what it is. It is, and, and I'm a little bit, um, should I use the word scared, to see the answers that Baltimore County comes up with 
I mean, it'd be one thing if they hadn't raised taxes yet, but they raised taxes, and right. I'm thinking they're going to try to find some backdoor ways to get more money. They'll have to. I mean, yeah. I mean, red, red light cameras, speed cameras. Again this quickly, so. No, no. I mean, mm. increased red light cameras, increased speed cameras, increased um, inspectors walking down streets, giving people $500 dollars for trash can lids not being there i mean i i don't know what they're going to do but that's a lot of money yeah you could raise money quickly that way too man and i don't know i mean i could be man i don't want to sound too uh what's the word i'm looking for like um like a sarcastic old man but it's kind of <laughs> like i just don't feel like this government's on my side it's like just constant oh, it's not. yeah it's just constant take 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 it's at a certain point you got to leave people alone and just let them live their lives yeah, the, the problem is, is government is like a cancer. I mean, it starts small and it keeps growing, and it's and it's this sort of self-feeding cycle. So it its whole existence is about growth, its own growth. So no governments are ever like cutting positions because they want to be responsible. They cut positions because the economy turns down, mm -hmm. but they're not like, well, we don't need this anymore. So we should get rid of it, you know. They're yeah. like, let's add another position and another position and another position. It, yeah. it doesn't ever go the other direction. Yeah. It only goes one way until there's some sort of, you know, economic catastrophe, and then sometimes it has to right size. But it's it's definitely like a like a leech or something on the on the taxpayers at this point. It's gross. Yeah. Now, is anyone down there mentioning tax cuts? Republicans are always mentioning tax cuts. Um, I'm sure we probably put in some tax cut bills this year. They'll get hearings and then they'll they'll die in the drawer like they always do. Um, I mean, they, Ludke's bill does cut the sales tax by one percent, so we've got that. But watch out, two point six billion dollars increase in revenue, which means it's all coming out of our pockets with the with the service tax. So. How many? I, I got to find out how many states even do this, and when they did it, what was the impact on their economies? I'm sure any states that have tried this, it has been a total catastrophe. Well, I'd like to see that research. So, going away from Kerwin funding, is there anything else that you want to bring up that we need to know about that's going on down there? So, you know, I'm on the judiciary, so all I deal with is. Um, crime bills and gun bills and things of that nature, family law, that kind of stuff. We did have a huge voting session today and we moved um, something like at least 20 or more bills and we did end up um, approving the withdrawal of the speaker's gun bill which was 1261 which was going to ban a whole bunch of guns well, that are regularly good. owned. So good. that's dead which is great. It was one of the worst ones. Hey, we got a victory. Um, we got one. Yeah, it was, it was a good victory. And uh, we have a storage bill. We still have the mandatory gun-free school zones for private schools, a couple of other bills like that. Um, we're just sort of waiting to see how they get amended and edited and if they move. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm kind of focused on, those kind of bills, and just keep an eye on them and, and trying to make them the least harmful as they possibly can be. And HB4, which was the long gun bill, the cross file over in the Senate seems to be held up. Uh, they they apparently did some amendments to it, um, and there's some disagreement between the two chambers as to what the final product should look like. So that bill could, again, end up in a messy conference committee, um, and... Uh, We'll have to wait and see what happens with the Senate. They they were considering voting on it today, and it didn't happen. So hold your breath on that one. And I will. And for our viewers out there, um, some upcoming guests that already are already booked. I've got Dee Hodges from the Baltimore County Taxpayers Association. Um, she said she wants to come back in. We haven't set a date for that yet. Um, we do have somebody from the Patriot Picket that I think oh, is coming in next Tuesday. And then Maryland Show Issue said they'll come back in. We just haven't set a date. So the, all, all the guys that we had in last year talking about the gun stuff, 
they're coming back in and D Hodges for the taxes are coming back in. All and, great guests. And now I want to bring up something that I think that you're going to like. Hold on, let me uh let me go to my computer here. And let's see if you can see this. Do you see the uh Oh yeah. Danielle oh, Hornberger yeah. birthday fundraiser. March the 6th from 6 to 9 p.m. Perryville Legion, post 135. 300 Cherry Street, Perryville, Maryland. Buffet and cash. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Everybody so, needs to go there and help her. Is there anything else you want to bring up? The only other thing that happened recently in, in Baltimore County, I don't know if you saw this, it was on Fox 45 this morning, was the AP history class at Lock Raven High School mm -hmm. had a slide they put up and mm -hmm. it compared Trump to Hitler and Stalin. It literally had a picture of Trump with a Nazi swastika and a uh, communist stickle underneath of him. And on the side margin it said, oh look, we've seen this before, or something along those lines. Really? Yep. And the uh, superintendent of schools essentially defended it, saying, Oh, it was a discussion about immigration policy and how foreign leaders had similar immigration policies to Trump. And I thought, oh, hold on, I, hold on, I got to jump in here. So you're saying yeah. when the Nazis were going all through Europe and forcing people from other countries to come into Germany and become slave labor, that that is somehow what Donald Trump is doing? Please. I know. I was like, the Nazis wanted open borders. They wanted Aryans to move freely through every country. Yeah. They didn't want borders unless it was borders around the concentration camp where they were murdering Jews yeah I mean they they forcefully imported millions of people for as slave labor and wanted Germans to go uh, and live in Poland and Russia right. I can't remember the German term that Hitler had for it, but you know Hitler's policies were not Trump's policies no he was a socialist he was a socialist and he wanted open borders I mean yeah uh, it's I don't know what planet we're living on where the people that are teaching our children are allowed to tell our children absolute lies about the history of the world. It's it's unbelievable. And comparing a president who wants to build a border wall to prevent drug traffickers and human traffickers from coming in is nothing like the policies of either Stalin or Hitler. Also, both of them were mass murderers. I mean... Yeah, anybody it's, like, it's that, almost like you don't have words for it, it's so bad. Yeah, anybody that would say that Donald Trump is adopting the policies of Stalin or Hitler obviously doesn't know history. You're right. Free market economics, none of that stuff. Trump's yeah. all about fascism and government control of the market. I mean, come on. It's just delusional. Yeah. So. Um, I don't know what to tell you about that one. I know. It's the country we live in. It's scary. And... Um, you know, like I say on a lot of these broadcasts, I'm not a Trump guy, okay? I didn't vote for Trump. I certainly didn't vote for Hillary. I'm a libertarian. I voted for the libertarian. But, man, it's so clear to me why people are running to Trump because what's going on in the political left is like I can't even take serious. Right. I, I, That's I, right. I just look at it and go, these people must be crazy. Yeah. I um, know. And in fact, uh, in, maybe in the next broadcast I'll bring this up, but... You know, if, if anybody knows anything about history, if you remember FDR would a, a lot of times talk about the forgotten man, and that term was actually brought up in the, I think it was 1857 for the first term, first time. And when you hear the first quote when they talk about the forgotten man, and you see what's going on in politics today, man, the Democratic Party has just completely forgot about the, the uh, forgotten man, because basically the forgotten man is the guy that has to pay for all these government programs because you've got person A, the politician says, oh, we've got this great uh, misdeed over here, we must help this person, and then you've got the person that's going to get the benefits, and the forgotten man is number C that has got to pay for it all. And when you read, when you read the original, where that originally came from, it's so clear that the Democratic Party has just abandoned the forgotten man and Trump is just there opening the door for him. Right, exactly. And yeah, that was what I heard when I door knocked. I mean, people sometimes didn't like his brusque New York style. You know, he's, he's always being a comedian. They didn't like that. 
but they were so tired of being ignored. I mean, even people who voted for Obama, some of them twice. You know, I have family members who voted for Obama twice and they're big Trump fans. That, that means you've really screwed something up if you had people who voted for change and thought that's what they were getting with Obama and were burned and have left the party and they're now um, big Trump supporters. Yeah, and if Bernie Sanders gets the do- uh, Democratic nomination, Trump is just going to walk right back in and I think that the uh, Congress will go back, the, the House... Uh, not the House of Delegates, but the uh, the House on the federal level will go yeah. back to the Republicans. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think both the House and the Senate will end up um, being all, you know all mostly red um, yeah. after the next election cycle. Because look, the economy is you know what what's the famous saying? It's the economy stupid. Yeah. It's the economy stupid. I mean, everybody cares about the yeah. bottom line. That is human nature. You want to be able to put food on your table and, and live a comfortable life. And when the economy is doing well, it's wonderful. People feel better, and, and they will vote for who, who made the economy better. Yeah. At the end of the day, I don't see any candidates up on the national stage of the Democrat side who even have a prayer of beating Trump. No, and um, I doubt very. I doubt it very much that you uh, watched the interview I did with one of the libertarian candidates that's running for president. But he said that his, um, basically on the Libertarian Party, the person that's winning is a complete joke candidate, and he's making a joke about the uh, these guys that run for office and say, well, if you vote for me, I'll give you something. So this guy's running on a ticket of, if you vote for me, every American will be given a pony for free. And he carries, ar- he carries around this big pink pony with him. Vote for me, you, get, this, a, you, you get a free pony. Is this the guy that also wears a shoe on his head? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't know the guy. Yeah, I want to. Yeah, I don't. I don't know the guy. But I want to interview him, but you know, he's he's being sarcastic, but he's pointing it out that promising. You know, if you're a voter and you think that you're going to get something that you otherwise wouldn't have by voting for somebody, man, you better be careful what you wish for. I know, I know. And if it's you want, really sad. If you want a pony, go out and buy one yourself. Earn it yourself. Don't expect the government to give you a pony. And I think that's yeah. the point he's trying to make. But the yeah. guy, the guy that I interviewed was Dan Taxation is Theft Berman, and uh, <laughs> yeah, and we talk about taxes a lot on um, TV Free Baltimore because basically I believe that we're all better off if we're left alone and let, and we're allowed to live our lives and keep the money that we earn and and get to do things like be responsible and prepare for retirement. Right. Absolutely. And and, I mean. and if the government wants to take uh, four billion dollars a year for Kerwin. That means it's a le- less opportunity for me to save for retirement. Of course, yeah. And, and put more money into the economy. Yeah. I mean, remember, our money being spent means it's going into the local economy. Yeah. That that is that is a loss for the state. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, it just seems like, again, uh, you know, I kind of stress this. I'm not a Republican. I think people watch this these shows that we do and think, oh, you. You're a Republican. I'm not. But, man, the Democrats, guys, you're just like these leaders down in Annapolis. And Johnny Oleski, it's like, I mean, I can understand that, you know, people get very, um, they feel very emboldened when they win an election. They put on their Sunday best and they've got this political power and they want to show that they're powerful and they, you know, raise taxes and buy, buy things and all. Yeah, okay, but if you're doing things that in the end are going to push the productive people out, which we've talked about, you're right. at the end, we're worse off. Oh yeah, absolutely. And people are fleeing the state. I guarantee you, if a Democrat wins the governor's mansion the next cycle, that uh, we are going to see mass exodus. People yeah. are going to be like, well, that's it. We're done. We're yeah. out. I, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. It's just so discouraging in the state and in this county. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, We'll see what happens. I don't think the governor is going to allow um, this money to come through the way they they think it will. I think he'll first veto the bill, is my guess, and then they'll override it. And then at the end of the day, he decides if he's going to disperse money. So if they think they're getting all that money for Kerwin, he could just yeah not disperse it. Yeah. So I don't know. But is there anything you want to add before we end here? No, that's it. Thanks for another great show. Yeah, and, th- and well, thank you. Um, this is your show, not mine. We're featuring <laughs> you, and uh, 
You know, who the hell am I? I'm just another guy with a bunch of opinions, right? <laughs> oh, that's really all I am. I'm just a girl with no. a lot of opinions and no filter. <laughs> no, but, but you're an elected official, and I think you've got things right. And I, and I think that, um, you know, people like me should be very supportive of you and like your friend, um, Danielle. Um, yeah, she's great. I think we do have people in the state that make good leaders and, and get it. Um, even Sheila Dixon, she'd get my vote. She's like, we wow, can't, we yeah. can't, we can't raise taxes. She's saying stuff. Yeah. yeah, she knows. Yeah. People will leave. Yeah. She's, that's, you know, there are a lot of people in the Baltimore city that still really um, support her and believe in her yeah. and think that uh, she was really set up. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to share the story that we talked about earlier, but yeah. Um, I don't know, but. And if the city has to raise taxes, it's just, it's going to affect Baltimore County too. And you're going to have more people flying out here and. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, am I wrong to be so pessimistic about the future? I know. We're like two pessimists on our own little show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes I say to myself, man, you sound like an old man that's just bitching and moaning. Um, maybe I need to take a, a better look at things. But For a uh, vacation. If only we weren't taxed so much, we could afford it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. Well, thank you very much, and let's send it there, and... Hopefully you'll find time next week. And to yeah. our viewers, um, stay tuned. As you've heard, we've got some great shows coming up after this. We have the interview with Sheila Dixon, which is on the Guardian Angel show, Beyond the Streets. Um, and then after that, we have a book and authors show where a woman comes in and talks about her grandfather and the military and his military service it's, that's actually a pretty inspiring interview when you hear about what this guy did in world war ii in korea and then after that paul stefan has on a local actor we, we try to make it local here and try to give you things that you don't hear anywhere else and i think we're doing a pretty good job with that so with that uh thank you and we will see you next time <laughs>
<laughs> I was like, oh my God. But that was a good thing. So I never got to thank you for that. But that's a big deal. You know, well, you know, for me, when I see people who are truly committed to working in the city, I mean, really committed, not just for the moment, but for long term and the impact that y'all were making in communities, particularly in Southwest area, and just to see the camaraderie of those who were part of your efforts, you know. Well, thank you so much. So I'm glad to have you here. And one of the things that I always want to ask you is what drives Sheila Dixon? I can ask you all kind of other questions, but who is Sheila Dixon? Sheila Dixon, um, I was born and raised here in Baltimore. I tried to leave this city so many times. I signed up for the Peace Corps. At that time in the 70s, it was so popular. It was a waiting list. Um, of course, I went to school here. I went to college here. I've been very active and involved in my community for a long time. I think it goes back to actually my mother, because my mother used to be uh, a Girl Scout leader, and I was part of the Girl Scouts. She was active with us in school. So I always had that drive to want to make a difference and change in communities. And I think what really kind of took me over the edge uh, was, was setting up when we started setting up food co-ops out of Bethel Church, mm -hmm. and we began to work with um, people in the community. We had over a thousand members. All this was volunteer, you know, organizing, you know, the food drives, organizing, the members participating. Um, and, and then, you know, I just, I, I, maybe it's my blood type, the fact that I just know that we have so much to accomplish. When I used to teach, um, when I graduated from, excuse me, undergrad and I started teaching down in Southwest Baltimore, I taught alternative ed. And then I would teach adult ed in the evening, and I got involved with my community association or some project that I had was involved in, something that was going to, um, <clears throat> something that would impact the community in a good way. So th that's just always been a part of me. You became mayor. You saw everything was going on. After you left the mayor's office then, and you're being on the outside looking in, what did you see? I mean, because... You know, there's something that just keeps pulling at you to come back. Well, part of, actually, when I left and, you know, reassessed my life and who I am and what I wanted to do and what my next chapter was, you know, and started working with um, minority contractors and companies and trying to help them to navigate, to get more business, you know, working with a couple of nonprofits that I was engaged and involved in. And, of course, even though you're not in public office, People always will contact you to help them, even with a job or with a problem they might have. And because of my network of people that um, understood my love and commitment to the city, you know, I was able to um, navigate that. You know, I started my consulting business. Uh, I was more of a social work than really charging people for um, services, um, as well as working with other candidates. But as time went on and I saw things that we had put in place, you know, when we partnered with the um, Guardian Angels and partnered with other groups and began to reduce crime in the city um, to its lowest that it had been in 30 years, you know, working with ex-offenders, um, cleaning up the city, greening up the city, um, focusing on a lot of health issues. I mean, I just saw that um, working with community schools and creating those in the school system, I just begin to see things kind of dwindle and move away from, to me, an agenda and a system that was really beginning to work. And I just would drive around and I would say, does people in public office see what I'm seeing? You know, whatever it is, the potholes or the trash that's been dumped or helping a company to navigate and not getting answers that you need. Um, and so that's kind of what drove me to say, you know what, let me, let me you know, step out in faith and, and run and come back and work with some young people in particular um, to help them to understand that if there's some systems that have been created and they're working, that you build on it. And of course you put your own ideas in it, but you just don't throw it away because it was somebody else's idea and you get real results. And I think we in Baltimore, we tend to operate like that, particularly in the political arena. 
um, versus, okay, some, she has something, you know, something, um, it, what she's trying to do is making a difference. Let me kind of assess this mm -hmm. and then figure out, you know, what the best pieces of, of this particular project or system that's been created and build on it. And, and I just saw the city just kind of, um, deteriorating again in certain communities. You know, the Freddie Gray incident was one of the really turning points um, that I just believe based on um, Fred Bilfell, who you knew mm -hmm. and met, yeah. and others who were part of his team, um, if they had been still in place, uh, because it's evidence that initially my predecessor at that time, if she had to kind of continue to build on that crime plan, taking a holistic approach, because crime was even going mm -hmm. down at, in 2011, but then it just kind of got out of control. Now, I'm glad you, glad you brought up the, the Freddie Gray thing. <clears throat> My thinking when, when it came to all that, and we were there, I mean, I was walking the streets with Elijah Cummings and all this, and it was such a bad time. But it seems like right after that, you saw the change in the police department. You saw the change in, in the community as well. We know that because we had to deal with the state's attorney's office. It seems like everything just kind of flipped over. And after that, it just, to me, it really doesn't look like we've recovered too well from it. The communities haven't. The police department hasn't. State's attorney's office hasn't. And not only that, if you remember, that was a time when you had so many people running for the mayor's office and running for, for the city council and run. I mean, everybody who had 15 minutes of anything to do with Freddie Gray was running for office mm -hmm. now. And it doesn't seem like, it just seems like we just can't, we can't go back before it was Freddie Gray. Everything has just kind of changed so much now. I mean, what, how do you see that, that whole time and what were you thinking during that time? I mean. Well, I think that some bad decisions were made when um, the incidents broke out as a result of those police officers and Freddie Gray that we could have handled it differently. You've got to have control of your city. You have to, you know, we could just take the day that, that um, there was um, through social media um, communication that kids were going to come out of school early and they were going to begin to ride and do things. Well, we should have had a plan in place Well, we had the MTA police, the city police, all of them, you know, where schools would have either let kids out early, let parents know, make sure they still mm -hmm. have public transportation, but make sure that we push them and stress them to go home. You know, not in a vicious, malicious right. way, but in an encouraging way that we don't want additional incidents to happen. We need you to go home. It's fine to protest as long as it's, it's in a way that you're not going to be um, abusive or um, to anybody else. else. You know, that incident that happened at Madamin, the buses shut down, yeah. the, the subway shut down. I mean, we should have been communicating with the governor's office and say, hey, we're going to might need to have state troopers in the city with us, along with MTA, school police. It's like there was no coordination um, at City Hall. And then there was no one voice. So then you had people now, OK, this is an opportunity to um, share my agenda because I got this. Um, objective to become the next mayor or whatever, mm -hmm. and I'm going to get out there, be visible, but not, um, it, I don't think it helped. And of course, we had people marching and the ministers came out. <clears throat> yeah, it was pretty bad. But that was, in my view, it was more a uh, show than having them go in the communities, talk with people, figure out what is it that we can do to help you so we don't so this incident doesn't happen again, and then we can help to correct some of the mistakes that we all have made. So where has the mayor's office and the governor's office failed? And I ask that because of the communication. To me, I know what my perspective is, but <clears throat> I'm coming from a community activist on the street. I'm not coming from a political background. And it seems to me that these, there's no communication to me. What do you see? Well, I think there's communication, but I think it's not the kind of constructive communication that's needed. And I think what happens is that we, you have to admit if you can't resolve something and you can't come up with a way to resolve it. I mean, it's okay, you're human, but if you have people that are willing to help, then they all need to be at the table and let's figure this out together. If the governor's gonna give us some resources, let's look at some of the ideas that he has as well. 
You know, let's not just say that what you want to do, Governor, is not what we want to see happen. It's about, we have to sit at the table and discuss it. This is what we need right now to deal with these issues that we're facing. We need to kind of create some job opportunities. We need to make sure we have um, youth works jobs when those kids get out of school this summer. Uh, we've got to make sure our police officers are out vis visible. If we um, have a shortage of police officers, we might need to partner with you take North Avenue and Pennsylvania Avenue. Mm -hmm. You have the um, uh, subway right there. So why not have this, the MTA police kind of walking the beat between the two stations while we might have one or two officers out there on that corner talking to residents, you know, moving them along? Because the bottom line is if you're not catching the bus <laughs> and you're not catching the subway, Get the step in. then you need to go <laughs> home or go wherever you're going to go. And it's like we, you know, it's like, We've accepted people just hanging and loitering. And I'm not saying being um, vindictive or aggressive with it, mm -hmm. but in a customer-friendly, professional manner. Look, there's no loitering. I need you to move them on. You know, if you need to go in the store, fine. But when you leave the store, go where you need to go. If you need to come back to the store, fine. But let's not hang around the store. Let's talk about the police department. Well, let's talk about the police, period. <clears throat> so we have, we have somewhat a new police commissioner. You know, there's been a lot of talk about the money and the performance, but let's talk about the police department as a whole. What do you see? Well, I think we're at a point in the police department that it's been through a lot. You know, we have a lot of good officers, people who have gotten into this profession for the right reason. They want to protect and serve. But we've gone through so many police commissioners. We've mm -hmm. lost officers who've left because of frustration of not understanding, excuse me, what's going on. Um, we have the consent decree because of different um, issues that were discovered by the federal prosecutors at that time um, and training that's needed. Um, we, we have too much money we're putting in the police department, in my opinion and we need to get better controls on that so we can do some preventive measures. But I think, you know, what we've had in the last six, seven years, Bats, Davis, the CISO, the SUSO. The SOSA and Harrison. Harrison. So that's like four <clears throat> yeah. commissioners. Four commissioners. And it, now, <clears throat> like you, you said that we've lost a lot of good people in the police department, which is true. Just for the rank and file, we're, we're short, what, maybe 500 <clears throat> police officers yeah, or something? Yeah, they said 600. Okay, so 600 police officers in the rank and file alone. But when it comes to the leadership over the years, now when we started the Guardian Angels here, a lot of the people who ended up being commanders were just sergeants and captains or whatever. And now these guys are all moved up, and a lot of the people that we had there aren't here anymore because of all the four or five police commissioners that we've had here. Because once you start... You flip over, you bring all your own people and everything. And, and it kind of, how do we stabilize this? And what do you do with the department now? I mean, you're, let's say you win tomorrow. Okay, when it comes to the police department, what is your goal? Well, my goal when it comes to the police department is we have to have a comprehensive plan in place that we all can buy into, that that officer on the street knows and understand all the way up to the command staff. We've got to, in my, and this is something that I think has to happen. The, if, you know, and hopefully, I'm not gonna, you know, one of the questions that's always asked is, will you keep Commissioner Harrison? Well, we, he and I need to talk. Mm -hmm. You know, make sure we're on the same page and we have the same philosophy and the, and the same um, beliefs in how we need to solve this. He's an expert at this, I'm not, but I also know that I've worked with a team of people that in the past have had great results. So I want to bring back some experienced senior officers who weren't necessarily a part of the bad pieces that were going mm -hmm. on, but were really trying to restructure the police department, you know, with the training. Um, I think you need a balance of experience and new and bring in some of our retired officers on contract to kind of work with the younger officers, you know, like a coach almost. Um, we got to create an aggressive um, um, recruitment plan. I want to bring back and, and keep it there the um, police and fire cadet at high school so that we can show young people who live here in Baltimore mm -hmm. that 
um, the criminal justice arena is a great career path. You know, that was eliminated. Um, you know, we want to deal, uh, you know, and as a mayor, you know, we want to focus on some of the other issues that, uh, that impacts our communities as relates to housing, quality housing, job training, job opportunities, you know, where we can connect people to that as alternative to being out in the street, um, do, being a squeegee per person on the corner. Um, so there are a lot of other pieces. We got to deal with the trauma that affects our young people today that we did not necessarily experience when we were young. You know, so we need to have those wraparound services in our school, you know, social work, psychologists, um, psychologists, um, medical staff to really work with kids and their families. Now, you kind of touched on this a little bit already with, with, with some of the programs you're talking about, but when it comes to the violence in Baltimore City, the shootings, the multiple shootings, even during the day, the low police you know, closures when it comes to capturing uh, what goes on out here, what do you see and wh how do you fix this? Because at the same time, now it's easy to say, okay, well, we can blame the mayor or the governor or the police commissioner or whoever it is. But at the same time, you know, <clears throat> one organization and one person is not going to fix it all. I mean, that's a big deal. That's one of the main things that everybody worries oh, about no, every day. Oh, no, it is. Well, we've got we've <clears throat> to gotta send some examples to some of these most violent offenders. You know, that's why one of the pieces that is so key is we've got to bring back the Criminal Coordinating Council where the state's attorney's there, the judge is there, parole and probation, um, all the public safety entities at the table because they have a role to play in this. You know, we have to send the message to folks that if you're going to have a legal gun, then you're going to have to go to jail. That's one of the you things know? that Bill felt put together as yeah. well. Yeah, and we had the gun registry <clears throat> where we were tracking individuals who had... Um, got um, arrested for illegal guns, but they registered that gun. We went and visited them with parole and probation. We looked at what other resources and services that they might need to help them to get a job or go into training. So you gotta connect those pieces as well. Have you been contacted by different people from different agencies or even people that are saying, hey, you know what, I work here, I need you to do this, which I'm, you know, I mean, Well, no, of... but I've been approached by people telling me about some challenges that go on in, in different agencies, particularly DPW with the water issue with the... Um, which has been going on with, forever. Well, but it hasn't because what people don't realize is that when they changed over to the new system for the waters, the new um, meter system, because you know we said mm. a meter, um, what we call them, readers, meter readers that would go out to really assess. They don't do that anymore. Everything is done by software. But the problem is that it's not jiving with the current meters, new meters that have been put out. So we've got to fix that and we got to make sure. But so I've gotten calls, you know, in reference to mm. different issues. And I've always just said in the last year or so, hey, look, you have an inspector general. If you see something not going right in that department, go to that inspector general because that is an independent office and they will get to the bottom of whatever's going on. So, um, but yeah, I have gotten calls of folks telling me about stuff going on. So are you ready for, are you ready for what comes next if you, if you, you become mayor? I'm ready for what comes next, you know, because I think I can pull together a great team because it's not just one person. You need a good team of people who really commit it. And then, you know, I want to work with some young people who want to get into government for the right reasons and understand that if this, let's take the gun registry, just using that as one example and as it relates to crime, because most of the candidate forms are crime and youth. And, you know, so we see that that's working and we provide the support services around that, then why would you stop it if it's going to have some success? Mm. You know, one of the disappointing things with the gun task force was initially it was working. They were getting guns off the street. And I think it just got out of control where nobody was supervising, checking in, and then officers said, okay, nobody's watching us. Let's go and plant guns or take drugs from folks. And, and unfortunately, you, you know, it happens. You got to just make sure you have your, um, the kind of people that, um, that are going to send the message and, and deal with that. Yeah. Well, I know we got to go, but real quick, what is <clears throat> your main concern getting in the city hall? What's one of the first things you feel you have to address? Well, I mean, the first thing that we have to address going into city hall is we have to deal with the crime. 
we've got a huge ticket item dealing with the Carwin um, Commission that's going to be, I, I think it's going to be passed um, in this General Assembly. And so we have to make sure that our legislators help us down in Annapolis because the city, if we had to raise 300 and some million dollars, we would have to do a lot of cutting and we have to do a lot of raising of taxes and this is what we can't do. And then really get back into, into customer service for our city government and our agencies, realizing that we work for the taxpayers mm -hmm. and that we have to be responsive. Wait, say, say that again. We work for the taxpayers okay, okay. and so we to have to be responsive and we have to do it in a professional manner and we have to do it in a timely manner and we want to do it so that we can keep our jobs. <laughs> you know, I think people lost that. I don't know what happened, you know. You call a person or agency to try to get an answer. Uh-uh. You know, we gotta, you got to figure this out a lot quicker than what maybe you've been working on. So. Now, I know I appreciate you coming. Thank you so much. But one of the things that uh, <clears throat> I wanted to do was just kind of talk to you about some of the stuff that you got going on because with all the town halls and all the meetings and all the media and all the crap and all this kind of stuff, I kind of wanted to give you, uh, give you your voice to say, hey, you know, this is this is who we we'll talk about something you want to talk about as opposed to all the other stuff you've been there. Got gotcha, you, got gotcha. no. you. You know, you've been there before. You you got you you know. I mean, obviously, you're, you're probably one of the strongest people I know, and. What do you want to say to everybody else before we wrap up? You know, for me, um, serving the citizens of Baltimore is really about committing to the love I have. We have a lot of great elements of this city. And a lot of times people lose sight if you listen to the news or you read the paper. But we really have a great city and we're on the verge to be even greater. But you've got to be able to have the kind of leadership and the kind of vision that can rally behind people and understand that you know, we have a very diverse city with great neighborhoods and communities, and people care about the city. But, but we focus so much on certain other elements, you know, and, and I'm not going to say that's not important, you know, because every individual who has passed away and died because of violent crime, that's a human being, and that's mm -hmm. a life, and that's somebody's daughter or son or, or grandchild. You know, I, I just ran into a friend yesterday who was going to bury his youngest son on Friday. He was sitting in his car and got shot. And so, you know, we've got a lot of healing to do. And so for me, it's really about the next century and, and moving into this century. We're going to be celebrating 300 years in another, what, um, 20, 29? Wow. And that says a lot for the city. And so we have to really focus on our young people. You know, when that baby is born, no matter what happens, we have to make sure that they have an environment where they can grow up in a healthy environment. And make sure they grow up, period. Yes, grow up, period, in a healthy environment that their families um, can sustain them and their families as well. we got to break some cycles, too, in this city. And that's something that's long-term. But if we set the platform or the... Um, foundation, we can do that, you know. So, um, you know, we've got, really got to move forward. And, you know, young people like the young man that I just met, mm -hmm. you know, we, we need to break some cycles as relates to him because he's very talented. Mm -hmm. And um, he definitely needs to decide what he wants to do in life because we've got to really focus on that. So, you know, I... I um, you know, as I said, right now I'm working with companies, helping them to grow their companies, expand their business. I'm working on a nonprofit project. It's a wellness and empowerment center. We uh, have a capital campaign going on with that. Um, I try to work out regularly to keep the stress down. I try to, you know, eat, you know, as healthy as I'm able to. And, you know, rest, I, I need to folk get a little bit more rest. I know that. And then just balance, because you got to have mm -hmm. fun. You know, I like going to a good movie. Um, or um, Do you or, get to do any of that? Other than work out, because every time I see yeah. you, you're either kickboxing or coming from the gym <laughs> or something. And I know you got the martial art back. I told you, we need to get together and train sometime. I know you got that. I know you got them black belts. We're good. <laughs> but, uh, but do yeah, you Yeah, I do get to go to movies sometime. I try to make a point in certain movies to go see. And, um, and also, I like traveling is when I can. So you actually have downtime. I do have some downtime. Now, with this campaign, you don't get much. <laughs> but you gotta have to take, sometimes you have to take time, yeah, yeah. you know, no matter what's going on, because if you don't, 
and you really can stress yourself out. That's why I try to work out. Um, but um, I think I've caught up on a couple movies that I've seen. There's one that was out, came out Valentine's Day. What is it? Um, my Valentine. Oh, the the photographer. I heard about yeah, it. Yeah, I, I would like to see I don't that. I get to go out much. Yeah, <laughs> I'd like to much. see that one. But um, I saw Bad Boys. That was pretty cool. That well, was funny. See, I don't get yeah. to go out much. I have to yeah. stay home and watch stuff on 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 demand because that's the kind of life I leave. That's what it is. Well, but see, you got to take the time and do that. I, I'm working on it. I'm yeah. working on it. So, but anyway, this is Strider. This is former mayor and maybe future mayor Dixon. This is Beyond the Streets, and we will see you next time. Welcome to TV Free Baltimore's Books and Authors. Hello. Welcome to the next latest edition of our Books and Authors series. And today we have a woman who's written an interesting book. It's a historical novel about the career of her grandfather in the United States military, in the United States Army in the Pacific, primarily. And he really was an unsung hero in our history. And it's somebody you know you should all read about. You should read this book. We'll talk more about how you should read this book right here, Once a Colonel. And our guest today is Heather Perrine Shree. Hello, Heather. Hi, Paul. How are you? <laughs> Doing good. Now, the first thing I want to ask is, you know, what compelled you to write this book? Well, in 2014, when I found his uh, diaries that were transcribed by the War Department, I immediately transcribed those into uh, a book that year. However, his career, which crossed three wars, was so extensive that I felt like a, a novel had to be done so that we saw the whole picture, starting in the 20s. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a flyer in World War I. Um, he actually came back, uh, went back to work for a little while, and then re-enlisted in 1920, um, and had an illustrious career in the, in the interwar years was called to the Philippines in 1941 and then was actually chief of the Maryland Military District during the Korean War mm -hmm. and then served um, Baltimore City as being executive director of civil defense until 1961. Yeah, it's amazing. And I was going to say, though, now what does the title refer to? It's kind of ambiguous, once a colonel. Right. Well, I, I picked that because, again, like you said, the unsung hero component and what he did while he was interned in the Philippines is unbelievable. And I wanted people to know that once upon a time, mm -hmm. there was a man who was a humanitarian who did everything under the sun for his men. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. I was going to say to you, what are the themes of the book, if people want to That's read a, it? It's a great, great question. So the themes are uncertainty. You know, there's the uh, certainty of the 1920s and 30s, mm -hmm. and then, the, you know, of course, the uncertainty of after the crash and the Great Depression, and of course, the distinct uncertainty of, of the war years in World War II. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other themes are light and dark. The sparkling light um, represents hope. Um, there is always this, with Julia, the female character, uh, there's this constant opening of old wounds and uncertainty on, um, you know, she married the right man, but it was the wrong career because what it did was is it constantly ignited her childhood, which was not entirely happy. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the themes. The other big theme that um, is also in my TV series, uh, The Colonel's Wife, is the fact that 
um, omissions are often filled with the wrong thing. In other words, we really need to fill omissions with something. Otherwise, something that you don't want is going to slide in its place. Mostly the truth. We want the truth in those omissions instead of hiding behind a screen mm -hmm. or a painted screen like with the Japanese. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. Because the way I saw it, though, of course, was main things would be his career, yeah. the Pacific, which a lot of people know a lot about a Pacific right. theater and and the United States Army. It's mm -hmm. usually that's the Navy's area. Right. And also that you bring up in that theme about the Japan building up from the 20s to 41 yes. and how people like Arthur said there's no surprise. We're yes. either going to get oh, hit no, in it's... Hawaii or in the Philippines. <sighs> it, yeah, well, and, and a lot of them didn't. You know, we had Plan Orange and Plan This. Yes, you know? there was a lot of, well, you know. I thought you were talking about novelistic themes, but mm -hmm. as far as the um, interwar years, yeah, that part. Uh, there is a 20-year, at least a 20-year buildup of, mm -hmm. um, we call them the Guardians of Empire in the Pacific Rim, mm -hmm. um, but the Army-Navy Board could never get their mind wrapped around how they were going to defend Oahu and particularly the Philippines. They never could get it together. When did you first hear about your grandfather's story. You're a little child. This is yes. just grandpa. Yeah, this was you know. mostly. But how'd you find out or what happened? It was <laughs> when I, somebody had, my, I think it was my uncle Doug, had handed me the war transcriptions mm -hmm. when I was 40 years old. I didn't read wow. them. I didn't read them for oh. 10 years. So, so you didn't until, even pick it up until even... you were 50. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's out there, folks. This, is, this woman looks great, but she's 55. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, when I, and that's what I said. When I read the diaries in 2014, I was completely blown mm. away. Yeah. Because he never, he, he had cute little stories about the war, like people losing their teeth by chewing mm. on the rice that had rocks in it. Mm -hmm. But I, of course, as a six year old, I would have never had any idea of what to ask, mm -hmm. ever. And my father, of course, because I think it was so wounding having a father missing and not knowing if he was going to live, mm -hmm. he never talked about it. So it really was when I read those four diaries that were transcribed by the War Department and, and Bill Shreve, his brother, that I was mm -hmm. absolutely compelled that this story needs to be told. Right. Now, speaking of that, we're going to get into a little bit, I'll ask you about mm -hmm. more broadly your writing mm -hmm. process, but what were your primary sources besides the diaries yes. and the war record? Great I mean, were like interviews with family right. members? Were there other documentation? <clears throat> Unfortunately, somebody like General Johnny Johnson was gone, yeah. but stuff like that. Well, that's a great question. So the, the only reference I had to start was the diaries. I had, having some forethought, interviewed Doug Shreve before he passed away oh, in good. 2009. So mm -hmm. I had that, like 90 minutes. But really, I was pretty much on my own because there wasn't anybody alive. Mm -hmm. So I had to go to the Personnel Records Division of the Archives in Missouri, and they sent me all 1,200 pages of Arthur's diary, which did not get lost in the fire of 73, luckily. Great. So I had that. And then I found online some declassified documents that affirmed everything that he insinuated in the diaries about the MSI, MISX and the players from declassified from NSA, CIA, and the U.S. Mm -hmm. Army that even named the truck driver and everybody else. Wow. So I got those document, documents, and um, that was enough. Because I was going to say, it's a shame you didn't like pick it up till then, like, say, five years ago. Yes. Because it was, you knew anything about it at all. When you were younger, you could have said, oh, Grandma, well, tell right. me your story. Well, Uncle that's right. Bill, if tell I, me your story. I knew nothing. You know, nothing. All of that. Because, think about it. Think about how painful it was for mm -hmm. Doug and my father. Of course. And then painful for my grandmother, so nobody ever talked about it. Well, my experience of anybody yes. who is at a military background and they've been in wars, yeah. is that something they never talk about? Yeah, it's true. I, it's, well, as I said to you earlier today, if I had known, because L.G. Shreve did survive right. all of them, yeah. um, if I had known what my Uncle Bill, which I spent a fair amount of time with, if I had known anything of what he had done to try to get closer to Arthur, I would have been, that's all I would have been talking about. Wow. Yeah. And that, does that also cover what you want to say about your writing process or no? Um, no, my writing process is much, is I get up every day at 530. I write longhand a great mm -hmm. deal of the time because my 
pencil to brain connection is there. It's okay. not a computer to brain connection. <laughs> so I unfortunately, at, at least now I can do it on the computer, but in the beginning, mm -hmm. I, writing out things is far mo more poetic for me mm -hmm. and far better word choices. I don't know mm -hmm. why. So I, I always write everything out longhand. And then I keep a journal of all my research notes okay. for every single bucket that I'm doing. Wow. So the novel, the television series, the this, the that. So there's different buckets that I keep ongoing notes for. Well, that's so, interesting. Yeah. Now we're going to ask you, because mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, even though you didn't know the story, you knew the players. Yes. And what are your memories of Arthur L. Shreve Jr., your grandfather? Well, it's only warmth and wonderful things because when I was five uh, I used to go visit him at his house and he used to sit me on his knee and we used to play this game called blackbirds on the fence where he'd put pieces of black electrical tape on his fingers and suddenly they'd fly away and <laughs> but I tell you what he he was he had a gift he made you feel like the only person in the room the only person in the world really mm -hmm. he just had that intensity you, I just felt so um, loved and seen when I was with him. Mm -hmm. We had a very, I think, very special connection. Mm -hmm. And of all six grandchildren, I have carried forth some of the traits, like the equestrian piece, mm -hmm. that no other, no other of the grandchildren. I even took flying lessons. Um, wow. So no other grandchildren have gone down those roads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now the question I have, mm -hmm. people will read the book. Mm -hmm. They'll say, this man seems to be, you know, Larger than life, yes. he seems to be a paragon. Yes. Like they say about some of these other mythical characters, he just kind of jumped out of the ground, yeah. fully formed. But we know that's not <laughs> true. Yeah. And so first, before mm -hmm. I ask the main question, yeah. I ask, did you idealize him in any way in oh, your I writing? Think I, oh, I think, I don't think I idealized him except because I do believe that he was made of steel and dipped in stardust. He had mm -hmm. those two qualities. But I did for the reader, even though I didn't know how he was, but I know what people say about him today, and it's not far off the mark, because my, my mother's uncles remember him very vividly, and they tell the same stories, mm -hmm. in the sense that he was larger than life. Mm -hmm. That he, after World War II, he just became known as the Colonel. Mm -hmm. And I have letters from all the major um, generals from that time saying, your war record needs no comment from us. How would you describe Julia McCoy Shreve's character? The character in the book? And, or, and the in woman. real life? Yes. <laughs> or at least where they intersect. Okay. I would say that Julia, in, both in real life and in the book, had a somewhat tragic childhood in the fact that her father was a missionary, and I mm -hmm. have a picture of him, where he oh, wow. left the family mm -hmm. and did tours in China mm -hmm. and died in China in 1904, 1908 wow. of cholera. And she was quite young then, right? Four. Four years old. She was born in 1904, October. Okay. So okay. she was a very young girl, and I think that marked her, maybe made her susceptible mm -hmm. to the male figure later mm -hmm. in life. I think it made her unhealthily attracted to uncertainty because she had a lot of it mm -hmm. as a young child. Mm -hmm. I think it, um, over the course of her life, I do think it created this character who was constantly, like you said, trying to find her legs and trying mm -hmm. to find her voice. Um, by the time I met my grandmother, when I was, you know, I was, of course, I met her as a child, but when I knew her as an adult, she had um, pretty much flatlined mm. from alcohol and from maybe the loss of Arthur, I don't right. know. Shame. Yeah, um, I couldn't really tell you very much yeah. about her, which is unfortunate. Yeah, because um, yeah, you didn't get, I mean, at that point it was too late, but you didn't see that beautiful, I vibrant woman. I didn't see the 20s that, and that, 30s that and 40s, no. In her anywhere. No, unfortunately not. It was very, very sad. I mean, in that way it's odd because she, in real life, became a tragic character. Right. Which is very sad, because I know my grandfather wouldn't have married a woman like that. She, no. I know from hearing family stories that she was lively, funny, mm -hmm. uh, you know, very, um, we would consider uh, progressive today. Well, yeah. she was, as I put it in the book, mm -hmm. kind of like sheltered, meek and mild when she gets to Hawaii. Right. But and then, it's her aunt or somebody yes, who, yes. who kind of brings her out of right. herself. Here's smoke because that's what the yes. modern woman it's does. It's the modern vices. Drink. Yeah, you the know, modern vices. Do yeah. For the 1920s. Now, right? I have to tell you, in real life, she had the modern vices. <laughs> She, she partake. She partook in the modern vices. I don't know how that yeah. all came about. But. And because of that, I said she didn't have a fully formed sense of self. It Correct. was all like who I am in relation right. to somebody else. 
I am Arthur's right. wife, and I live for well, Arthur. Well, that's right, which makes you know. her an empathetic character, right. both in life and in the book. And that she was a mom, and you yes. said she did like the things that moms should do, or at least yes. the basics of life. Yes. But I'm wondering if she was like 100% mom, giving you that emotional support yes. and all that other kind of encouragement I, that a mother needs to do. I would only, could only guess and tell you that she did the physical thing, mm -hmm. but how emotionally invested she could have been, I think she was kind of drained at, in, during World War II, just from yeah. surviving. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was beyond. I mean, some of the stuff was typical of a lot of army wives whose yeah. husbands are gone for a long period yeah. of time, a year or two, and he yeah. comes back again. Yeah. And I think it doesn't really say it in the book, but it can be implied. A lot of times she's hoping that Arthur will retire oh, right. after 20 years yeah. and that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no luck there. <laughs> And then he's called back, you know, for the Philippines. Right. And, yeah, unfortunately. And then he does another 20 years from <laughs> 40 to 61. So <laughs> She's no, there's no rest the for poor, the weary. The poor yeah. woman. Now, the other thing to bring up in there is that the, what I thought was remarkable in the book, Julia and Arthur's relationship. Yes. It seemed to be Hollywood romance, and it seemed to be, I don't know where you got this from, it seemed like it was love at first sight. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of physical passion yeah. in this relationship. Well, I did that to, 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 like I said, tee up the audience uh -huh. for the lack of it. And I'm wondering whether that was invented by you or that you heard stories or there are letters that well, are a little steamy or things that will give yeah. you that implication because you do set a lot of scenes. You write it very well Thank and you. I think very delicately. Thank it's you. not Harlequin romance right. and it's not porn. No, I but, you know. <laughs> It, no, but, but it is as you we, we stay said. in the what I say literary R category. It's, it's, it's yes. steamy though. Yes. Well, I can tell you uncategorically that from my uncle Doug, he would say to me often, they had a love affair. It was a love, a lifelong love affair. Which I, I is know great. that for, tr for for real. Uh, secondly, I can also tell you in real life that in fact, uh, in in the book it's twenty two, but in fact they met in a very small window in nineteen twenty three in Oahu. Mm -hmm. while he was visiting James Barney. Um, wow. So I can tell you that it, pro it was love at first sight because mm -hmm. it was a very small, he, she was only there for eight weeks or less. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's how they met and it, that was the beginning. Yeah, because I wonder what, how much maybe you invented and how much was real. Was she considered such a beauty? Because it's like they would go to all these parties and the yeah. other men would be um, coming up to her and well, the, on, coming on to her. I've seen like a few, yes. few photos. I've seen that was remarkable. Like 50-second yes. video. I don't know if that's your father on the baby on the knee. or That's my dad, yes. You saw that? The yes. 1931 video? Yes. Oh, my goodness. It's almost, almost like the teens because she's dressed up yeah, with a man's was, tie. Well, it was 1931. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, can, I, I did the beauty part for the novel mostly. Mm -hmm. The truth of it was, I, I don't know that she was a great beauty because I didn't meet her until she was in her 70s and 80s but, as an adult. But did she have a sparkling personality She did, then? that's that the it. thing, that's the thing. It was the spark and her humor and everything, her wit. Uh, she had all of those qualities and very smart, of course, yeah. you know. Um, so invented wise, the beauty, we might have, I might have fictionalized the beauty a bit much, yeah. but the truth of it was she had a lot of good qualities. Well, I think the important thing that you can convey with what we'll call literary license yeah. is to author, she was the most beautiful well, woman in the right. world. And that was true. Mm -hmm. That was true. And because women were falling all over him in your book, oh. too. Well, that's because <laughs> a true late, real life you saw in that video at 31, he was a very <laughs> handsome man. He was man. always a good looking guy. I don't very know what he was handsome. like after Baton, because I know he comes back, he he's was like still 96 handsome. pounds or something. Yeah. Well, no, he, he gained. <laughs> oh, that's right, he got up on to 130 ship. or something. Yeah, no, like, <laughs> you know. But no, he gained it back. No, he yeah. was still very handsome, yeah. even in, well into his 50s. I'm sure. Yeah. He was a distinguished man. Yeah. So, I mean, I wanted to know about how much of that really was, you know, made up. Now, the other thing to bring up, too, is the diaries are yes. very important yes. for a couple of reasons. It chronicles for you what he went through, mm -hmm. but it was also became important when the United States government yes. got a hold of it to say, how did the yes. Japanese, you know... Well, it became submittable evidence in the international war crimes Their prison camp treatment of, of, of uh, yeah. American soldiers. Well, it became submittable evidence in the international war crimes trials in 1947, 6 through mm -hmm. 8, and it actually did, and I couldn't, I can't, verify this, but I heard from my mm -hmm. family that it did put away some of these Japanese criminals. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah. Now, another thing I wanted to bring up, I don't know if everybody pick up on this, but it seems like there's a Christmas motif in your book. There are so many scenes where something's happening at Christmas. There's a, as every Christmas and New Year's, it's really? almost every year <laughs> you put something in there of something going on. You know? Oh, you mean in the, in the in, prison camp? No. Oh. All throughout. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, well, probably because I think well, certainly in the prison camps, all the men, they all globbed onto the holidays because right. was, that was the only time they had decent meals. 
Um, I, think, I think the holidays for everyone brings up poignant, poignancy. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, it, it shows contrast because mm -hmm. clearly Arthur wasn't there. Mm -hmm. You know, I think holidays are special to people. And, mm -hmm. and then when there's an absence of something, I think it becomes even more glaring right. over the holidays. Right. Yeah. Well, another bring, thing I want to bring up about his remarkable career, I don't know if we've said it on mm -hmm. camera yet or not, yeah. he was offered a generalship at one point. Correct. He, and he, this is a man, remember, I should let the viewers know, I have nothing now why he's so remarkable in that he didn't graduate high school, he did not go to West Point, nope. and yet he was offered a star. Correct. A brigadier general in 1946. That not many people would say mm -hmm. somebody who hadn't even completed high school yeah. would make a general in the United mm -hmm. States Army, or at least be offered the position. Even right. though I saw something I didn't quite get, was it? He was a full colonel, and then he was bumped back to Correct. lieutenant colonel. Oh, yeah, that's a whole story. And then there was, he fought it in court. Yes, he did. And he got it back. He that's got his correct. rating back. It took him seven years to get it back, but he did. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that, that's another thing. Yeah. Uh, that, how amazing it is. Now, briefly bring up, too, a little about his brother's remarkable. Yes. Bill's devotion to Arthur. Yes. And L.G. Bill yes. Shreve's <laughs> service yes. in World War II and beyond. Because you were saying he, he, was not about, a he might slacker. have been a, a spy or something. No, that's, he's, he definitely <laughs> wasn't a slacker. So, you know, yeah. again, following in Arthur's shoes, mm -hmm. he went to ROTC at Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think he was completely fully enlisted in the Army until, mm, I want to say, 1938. And then right. when Arthur was quartermaster at Fort DuPont, he reeled Bill in there as, uh, to work with him there right. for a year or two mm -hmm. before he was called. So... Mm -hmm. But then Bill, when, when Arthur became interned uh, by the Japanese, Bill, in real life, uh, somehow got a transfer to the Solomon mm -hmm. Islands right. and uh, hopped up from New Caledonia all the way up to mm -hmm. Guadalcanal right. with the Mosquito Network. And we know for a fact that they were in contact because right. Bill was able, they, between the two of them, were able to discern where, the, he, was, where he was going to bury those diaries so Bill could go back in and evacuate them out. I also know they were in touch because Arthur, somewhere in the beginning, built a radio crystal receiver in the bottom of his army canteen right. so he could listen into the Japanese. I, right. I, I was told by one of the um, advisors on this book, J mm. Jim Turner, who unfortunately has passed away just last year, um, that if it's probable, it's possible. Because if, you know, the things that you think might have happened, they weren't that far away, Guadalcanal mm -hmm. to the Philippines. And at night, if the trajectory was just right and the air was just right, they could have, he could have heard Bill. Mm -hmm. And he heard other things, too. And he heard a lot of, a lot of other things, like too. Like Tokyo Rose and yeah, things like that? Yeah, probably. Oh, yeah. He was just listening in to see if he could break in, I think, to the, to the Japanese uh, Well, it's amazing, channel. like yeah. I said there, that seemed like everybody, like you said, the Stardust part, that Arthur re Shreve touched, touched, he touched everybody's lives he to the did. point the family, they're all devoted to him. He's away. Yes. The, the sisters are, yes. are worried about yes. him. His brother's worried about him. His brother goes and tries to yes. be with him in World War II. Julia is, you know, he's the man for her. Yeah. You well, know? and true, in real And the life. men all devoted to him. But you yes. read these stories, and I say again, like, he, even when he wasn't, like, in charge of the mm -hmm. camp, yeah. You know, at Christmas and other times, he'd go around yes. to every man in the camp and yes. shake their hands, you know, and everything. He wanted to make sure everybody was okay. He was a nurturer. He Not was. just responsibility. No, he was but a, a nurturer. humanitarian first, right. last, and always. And, you know, after he passed away, well, you saw that thing I sent you from WBL. Right. But the truth of it is, when that his uniform came back to me, I got calls mm -hmm. from all over the country and letters mm -hmm. and emails because he did touch not just the 75,000 lives, okay, in the, in the death march, but he touched thousands of lives, thousands, mm -hmm. so much so, mm -hmm. I have to tell this quick story. Go right ahead. In 2015, I had, this has nothing to do with Arthur until we get to the punchline. <laughs> okay. uh, in 2015, I had a DHR uh, energy mm -hmm. upgrade done on my house, mm -hmm. you know, new mm -hmm. siding, the whole thing. Manager from Washington, who I've never met in my life, comes mm -hmm. through my living room, he stops. He said, is that Colonel Shreve? Mm -hmm. I said, well, he said, is that Ma uh, General Shreve? I said, well, Colonel Shreve. He said, my wife is from the Philippines. They know all about Colonel Shreve in the Philippines. Wow, because the grandchildren mm -hmm. of those survivors of the Philippine Army mm -hmm. know the story mm -hmm. of the colonel that greeted them after the longest march of their life. Mm -hmm. Now, have you 
check that or verify that to say, is he known in the Philippines? Are there any memorials to him I, in the I Philippines? Do, well, I do know this because the wife of this guy, his uh -huh. mother, her mother was a historian, uh -huh. and they know about Colonel Shreve in the Philippines. When we really don't know about him in America. I know. It's crazy. That, that is something. <laughs> And now to bring something up, because you want yeah. to bring these stories to life so more people do, yeah. besides the book, yeah. talk about the, mm -hmm. the movie, possible movie and TV yes, deal. I sure will. So in that same time frame in 2014, I thought, OMG, this would make a phenomenal movie. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. So I wrote the rough screenplay. It wasn't great because I didn't have all the good information yet. Right. But I've rewritten it not nine times, and now I've gotten it to some minor studios that are looking at it. But it is... And it's ramped up from even the book. I mean, it's it's wow. a thriller, basically. You know, is he going to get caught or is he isn't going to get oh, caught? Oh, that whole yeah. part of yeah. you know, so, smuggling out the messages yeah, and all that. Yeah, plus it's, you know, Julie at home struggling with mm -hmm. everything that she struggles with right. and all of that. So that's the movie, Once a Colonel. And then I thought, you know, just like you said, his life is so interesting. And he touched on so many American firsts. I ha and from her perspective, I thought, I have to write something from her perspective. Mm -hmm. So I've written four episodes. Um, of a TV series called, called The Colonel's Wife. And what that does is show us that 20-year buildup to mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor well, and cool. the spy aspect that was mm -hmm. going on in Hawaii at the time because people don't know that there was a lot of racial tensions between the Filipinos, mm -hmm. the Japanese, and 45% of the island in that time, was, they were, were Japanese. And right. Sh Schofield Barracks, uh, they were actually concerned that they were mm -hmm. gonna be overrun by the Japanese even back then. Mm -hmm. So there was real concerns about that guardian of empire mm -hmm. piece. And I go into great detail. I mean, there's so much history that people don't yeah. know right. about the war, uh, the, the war, war plans. The war before the, the war. The war before the war, the war plans, the war games mm -hmm. at, the, at the colleges and how it was a clear loss to the Japanese for decades. Mm -hmm. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. But so. I mean, in your book here, this book, you yeah. allude to it because you say the guy who is like the housekeeper or the cook or something oh, in the, Hawaii. Oh, the Omichi, and he's the yeah. same spy. And he is, and he spy. is a spy. Yes, that's the one right. one who gives her the red that, fan, that the is, Japanese fan. Right, so he in the TV series becomes a full-on spy. Oh, okay. It's just yeah. kind of like, is he or isn't he in the book? Well, Until you mention it, you towards the end, you say, he was. Well, you, you know, can only when, go so deep into these things. Yeah, I know. In the, in the but novels. it's terrific. That's yeah. why you're going to do it yeah. in your show. Yeah. Now, the important thing, too, like the book and on other things, you should talk about the Shreve Foundation. Yes, the Shreve Foundation. Not now. Pro hopefully, after I get one of these things produced, I really, it's on my big long-term radar, is mm -hmm. to create the Shreve Foundation, which would be... A, a repository for stories like this that families don't know what to do with. Mm -hmm. It would be a public source for research. It would be a full museum, mm -hmm. and it would be a theater to have ongoing reels, movies, and everything that have to do with the first half of the 20th century in the military world. So Perfect. it would be an ongoing, and bookstore, art, mm -hmm. you know, the museum piece, the uniforms, the stories, the donations that people would want to give. Mm -hmm. We'd have to be a little specific and stick to World War I and II. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're talking about as close as we can get to living history for the next generation. Oh, that's, that's great. And in fact, I know they say sales of your books and everything kind of... Make, yeah, and they would all, all steer. It all goes towards... Well, that's correct. It's the, all steering this. back to that. So it's not like you're making huge profits off the book because it's going to go into the foundation. Eventually, all of yeah. this is going to be a self-funding prophecy. Which is yeah. amazing that a lot of the stuff that you've already accumulated yes. from Arthur's career... Yes. And there's going to be a repository for that as yes, well. Yes, exactly. Which is exactly. terrific. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. And then the thing that we want to end with is look over into your camera here, over yes. here, and let people know your contact information. Oh, How can they find you. out about you? How can they yes. find out about all that you have to offer? Yeah, so um, heathershreve.com, www.heathershreve.com. I'm there. I, you can look on YouTube. I'm on LinkedIn, and um, that's the best place to find me. Oh, terrific. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, you're very welcome. It was glad, uh, a very big pleasure to have you here. Well, thank Even you. Though, it was folks, great to be seen. This is a very long book, but it's very fast to read. Because the first half, you get the romance and Hawaii and the war before the war. And what Arthur does in World War II is incredible. You have to read it. I could tell you stories, but then you wouldn't read the book. <laughs> so read that book and help this lady get more money for the Shreve Foundation. Yeah. <laughs> and so thank you, Heather, thank for you. being here. It was a pleasure. And OK, folks, so that's the end of another issue of our Books and Authors series. And until the next time, I'm Paul Stefan, and we'll see you then.
you're watching Books and Authors on TV Free Baltimore. watching the Paul Stefan show on TV free Baltimore hello and welcome to another edition of our program today we will be talking with a woman who is multi-talented but will be primarily focused on her acting career in fact she's also along with that a globetrotter because last month she was actually at the Cannes Film Festival on the red carpet and so we're here tonight with Vanessa Meadows. Welcome, <laughs> Vanessa. Thank you. Hello. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Now, I think a place to start for us would say, talk about your current and recent projects, at least since we've seen you last, I okay. guess. Okay. Uh, well, so I'm primarily based in Baltimore and in the Mid-Atlantic, and um, I'm also SAG. Mm -hmm. And uh, Prior to joining the union, I was a lot busier than I am now Interesting. acting. Um, <laughs> just because I I am pretty choosy about the roles that I audition for. Mm -hmm. um, and with that also being in, in the union, it definitely does limit you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've spent a lot of my time since joining the union doing production work. Um, oh, yeah, and uh, so most recently I did, um, I was a lighting assistant for oh. a short film in Virginia, which was actually really, really cool. I really, really enjoyed that. <laughs> okay. um, <laughs> got to play with cows and oh. be in the milking parlor and get muck <laughs> in my boots. It was fantastic. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, and then uh, I was also associate producing a film, uh, a Christmas movie mm -hmm. that's, uh, it was supposed to be filmed in the spring, but uh, filming has actually moved to the fall, and I did step away from that project. So right now I'm focusing mainly on my music, uh, and I'm mm. hoping to start uh, shooting a short film coming up soon. So a lot of my focus right now, uh, if I'm not able to act, is prepping for the film that I, I would like to do. Now, will this be a film that you will be shooting yourself or that you're yes. just going to be in? No, I, I'm focusing on writing it. I want to direct it. Uh, wow. The very first, I did a, a film in college that was very low budget. Okay. <laughs> it was for uh, a film class that I, I ended up doing. Right. That was about 10 years ago, if not a little bit more. And um, so before I start really delving into my next project as a filmmaker, I want to start really small and just figure out how I can best go about everything. Mm -hmm. So this next one, I really want to figure out how how do I direct? How do I write? Mm -hmm. uh, how do I fix what I've done? Um, I've already edited, um, and I, I have directed theater, but not film. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I tried lighting out, and I really enjoyed that. Uh -huh. Producing I've done. So I've, I've already done a lot, casting, mm -hmm. but I haven't done it for my own particular project. Right. So I'm trying to keep it small. I really want it to be a very short film. I don't want to spend too much money because I really <laughs> see this as a learning process. Right. Um, and I'll make as many of those as I have to until I feel like I can actually make a decent film and, mm -hmm. and bring a lot of other people in. So uh, I'm just trying to figure out the kinks. Well, I was going to say, I have seen things you've already mm -hmm. done on your own. Thank you. Like the one about <laughs> uh, the dance school. Yeah, and yeah. You did that one? Yep. That was your own filming and editing there. Yes. Because, I mean, definitely. there was no voice and that was just music. Right. And then there's the one about that historic home in mm -hmm. Carroll County. Yeah. And, and you were sort of a narrator for that. But yep. you've. And I hosted, uh, yeah. Hosted, filmed, I guess, edited that thing mm -hmm. too. So it's not an unfamiliar ground for you. But no, absolutely not. Um, 
I would say that with those, those were more side projects because right. I was so focused on acting. So it wasn't as high quality as I would have wanted it to be because I wasn't able to give the amount of time or uh, production quality that I, I wanted to give to it. Mm -hmm. um, and funds were limited because right. I was being paid for those things. Mm -hmm. um, the historical house docu tours, I call them docu tours, I completely right. made them up. Okay. Um, I love history, as you know, <laughs> and I love historic buildings and abandoned buildings and um, urban exploration, is what oh. it's called if you explore. Right structures in a city or, or a civilized area right, right here in that Baltimore, are we have Dan Bell abandoned so Dan Bell does that all the time oh really yeah oh great well I'll have to get look into him. them um, he's, on, but, he's on YouTube okay <laughs> <laughs> so I, I decided you know if I'm gonna do this and I I'm involved in the industry why not make something out of it mm -hmm. um, and then I thought well I wonder if I can make money doing this oh. so I figured well I'll go to the realtors and I'll see if they're interested because mm -hmm. I was already researching the structures mm -hmm. I was going into them legally mostly <laughs> and <laughs> uh, and and I was really spending a lot of my time on that because I love research and that's mm -hmm. one reason I love being in the film industry as well so uh, Real, realtors actually did um, end up reaching out to me and having okay. me do quite a few houses. Um, and so I got to get paid to do that, but it took, it took so much time and effort and hours. Um, and so about a year and a half ago, I, I decided I was gonna take a break from that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, and businesses, I was um, also doing promo videos for right. businesses. And it was really just because I enjoyed the editing. Uh, I enjoyed location scouting. I've done that as well for other projects, not just my right. own. So, um, and and I knew along the way that they were teaching me something for mm -hmm. moving forward in in my filmmaking career. Where did you make that switch to to film, or what 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 happened that you went from you know stage acting mm -hmm. to film acting? So, basically, I decided in two thousand and ten that I was going to take a break from acting. I was teaching at a children's theater school, Syracuse Children's Theater, for mm -hmm. a, quite a few years. Um, and I was just feeling burnt out. Mm -hmm. I really just wanted to act. And there weren't a lot of acting opportunities in Syracuse at that time for me, because I was also having to work two part-time jobs to make a full-time job and then working at the, or at the uh, children's theater. So I just didn't have a lot of time to act. And um, so I decided to take a break. I moved to Gettysburg because I love history. Mm -hmm. And I begged to work at this museum. And I went in three times. And the third time, he said, OK. So I ended up being uh, the only person that worked there other than the owner. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I was officially Vanessa the intern. Uh -huh. And within a few months, uh, I think it was a few months, we ended up getting a reality show. Oh, okay. Who knew? I, I <laughs> took a break from acting, and here acting was. Uh, okay. And uh, so I ended up being a lead in that show, and we filmed a whole season. What would you say your favorite types of roles to play, or do you have any yet? Yeah. So one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that I, I love to act is because I, I want to touch the audience in their most vulnerable part. And being able to do that for me means hitting the core of who people tend to not show. So grief, sadness, mm -hmm. anger, those mm -hmm. are not things that are uh, socially acceptable to show usually. Mm -hmm. And so they tend to end up becoming very hidden, very mm -hmm. private, um, and it can be a very lonely place, mm -hmm. um, even grief. Mm -hmm. So. Those roles, I, I realized over time, those are the roles that I actually um, really thrive in and really enjoy doing because mm -hmm. to me it's the most emotionally connected that yeah. I can be with the audience. Right. And even when it's um, film and TV related, when I'm filming, the, to me, and maybe it's because I did theater, the audience is right there with me. Right. We are intertwined and how I'm feeling is how they're feeling. and it's because I don't want them to feel alone. And I know that that mm -hmm. seems super silly to some people, or well, it probably does. No one said anything yet, thank you. But um, <laughs> it probably does sound silly to some people, but really I do feel like it's 
it's my job as an actor to comfort the people in the audience by letting them know that I feel what they feel and they're not alone. Well, this is what you could maybe have gotten from theater because it's not so strange what you said because the best actors and actresses can kind of reach through the screen mm, yeah. and touch yes. the audience yes. in those kind of intense moments Absolutely. that you're talking about. Yes. And if you already have that intent or how you want to project, then you will be able to project that across the screen, I mm -hmm. think. Uh, because it's opposite to what you see. It's like your look and your personality. You say, oh, she's the star of the new sitcom, Vanessa. You know, oh. like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> thank you. you know, seeing this, this, I mean, this, I love that too. <laughs> this season on Fox, you know, it's, it's Vanessa here. Thank you. But, but I mean, that kind of heavier stuff, I mean, so yeah. Yeah, that also probably answers the question I was having about, uh, you know, the type of roles you want to play, which mm -hmm. I think it's the same. Now, yeah. with the many talents you have I mean singing dancing you know acting uh, writing mm -hmm. motivational speaker fitness trainer yes. on and on uh, historical researcher Has you ever, <laughs> ever thought of things of how you can maybe find a way to either balance them all or incorporate them all into something into a project yeah um, balance them all that's a really interesting word that you use because that's really the the goal for me every single day is to have balance. Mm -hmm. um, I was so obsessed with acting and theater before I moved to Gettysburg and, and shifted into film and TV that I, I didn't realize how out of whack my career was. Okay. Because when I was finishing out a show, I was already in rehearsal for another. Mm -hmm. And it went on that way for probably 10 plus years. Um, I haven't done the math. But it was a really long time, and I just didn't realize how caught up in it I was. And it was really um, energizing, but it was also really draining. I'm sure. Yeah. And then when I hit that wall, it was just disastrous for me emotionally. So um, that is definitely one thing that I strive to do. Um, living in the Mid-Atlantic and not you know, splitting my time, I'm married. And my marriage is really important to me. And so sometimes I feel bad that I haven't just moved to New York or moved to L.A. or Atlanta and left my husband behind because that's how important my career is. And for some people, that is totally fine, and I'm not mocking them at all mm -hmm. um, because that, that is something that I would love to be able to do. But Nick, my husband, is really important to me, and, and our marriage is important to me. And so for me personally staying in the mid-Atlantic for right now while I, I continue to build my understanding of who I am as a storyteller and, and an actress mm -hmm. um, is what I'm choosing to do. Mm -hmm. And um, so while I'm doing that, I'm trying to figure out how do I balance everything? Oh, you you know, <laughs> acting is the number one. It right. will always trump everything for oh, me okay. in terms of the things that I would like to do. Mm -hmm. But while I try and craft that side of my career, I'm also saying to myself, okay, today I'm not gonna be on set. I don't have any auditions today. What can I do that's acting related, but that's also going to help my career in other areas? Mm -hmm. And that's when I start writing, or I start working on my music, oh, okay. or I do some historical research about a character that maybe I'd like to play mm -hmm. in an upcoming film. Mm -hmm. I prep a character from a screenplay that I've never read as though I have that character that I'm about to, to, to shoot mm -hmm. and, and film. Um, and that's one thing that I talk about in my workshops is balance, you know? Okay. Thinking about yourself, this is something that I, I came to realize. Thinking of myself as an actor, as a whole, and then living my life as an actor, instead of someone who acts and then does all this other stuff. Changing my perspective about that and thinking, even if I go on vacation, I'm an actress on vacation. What I'm doing is going to help my career somehow because I'm experiencing things. Mm -hmm. I'm an instrument, I'm a living tool. So everything right. I experience, I can use towards my acting. Mm -hmm. um, 
including the writing and the editing and, and everything else, bike riding even. So that's one thing that I try and focus on in my workshops is helping everyone understand that, yeah, to your point, balance, how do you balance it all? Changing your perspective and really focusing on each day having an inner balance, but also with the things that you do, trying to balance it out and not being so hard on yourself. Well, very good. That's quite a complete answer. So I, I'm a talker, sorry. That's good. <laughs> That's very good. Okay. Because I was going to say that, I mean, even far back, as far as acting, I remember, because I've I follow history of film, too. Mm. But the great director, D.W. Griffin, he had the young Gish sisters. And he said, mm. for them to learn how to act, he just wanted them to go in the streets of New York and observe people. Oh, that's great. And see, that's how you learn acting. See how different people do things, how they behave, how they yeah. do in that situation or their movements. And, mm -hmm. and so that's sort of what you're saying. It's kind of being aware and using anything and yes. everything under that identity of actor. Yes, and also just as actors, you tend to... Not everyone, but a lot of times, if you're not constantly acting, which is probably not going to happen for most actors, M most, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Is if you're, you know, when you're acting, it's yeah, my career is going up and blah blah blah, and then suddenly you're out of work again, and then you plummet down, and that's how it's going to be probably forever, no matter who you are. And so, how do you combat that? How do you take control and mm -hmm. focus on what you can control? And one of those things is. I'm always an actor, mm -hmm. and I'm always working on my career. Everything I do is to move my career forward. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm not filming, I am taking purposeful steps, and I'm taking action, and I'm setting goals that will continue to move me forward so that I don't yo-yo. Mm -hmm. I just constantly stay like this, and if I get a part, ah, yay! Okay. And then I stay up here and go, yay! <laughs> and it just keeps going up. <laughs> there you go. How do you prepare for a role? Okay, <laughs> so I was never taught a specific method. A mm -hmm. lot of people um, say, well, I've, I've done Stanislavski or you know, method acting or this and that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was never taught any type of method. I didn't get a coach until mm -hmm. maybe college or okay. a few years okay. um, at the end of high mm -hmm. school. Um, so I really kind of had to figure it out mm -hmm. myself and I really, I sucked in the beginning. I really, really did. Mm -hmm. And some of the the programs that I was in, I did a lot of ensemble work at the beginning, and I never got the roles that I wanted. And I, I do think some of it was just, you know, how it tends to be in the industry, film, TV, and theater, it's who you know. And they tended to know the person, and so that person would get the role. And I was just so mad about that every time. Mm. Um, so it actually forced me to be really good. I, mm -hmm. I'm not saying I was amazing, but it forced me to strive for that goal. Mm -hmm. I was constantly competing with myself, which I still do, um, to be better than I was before. Very critical, sometimes not in a positive way, but each time striving for more and, and for better. Mm -hmm. um, and so eventually I got to a point where I started getting the lead roles. And um, wow. what was your question? <laughs> well, so, so you didn't like, have, for example, preparing, preparing for a while. So for example, you Thank don't have you. coaches, you don't have groups of actors that you right. do actors workshops, or do you create a backstory for your character? Those kind of things. Okay, I'm really sorry. That's okay. So you're doing fine. So yeah, at first, um, I I learned really bad habits. Um, leading up to the point where the show would actually go on. Once the show was on, I was totally in character. We were in sync. Um, I, the character to me is always someone else mm -hmm. that I get to know. I don't choose anything. Oh, they okay. show me who they are. Interesting. Um, and the, whatever process I went through, even as bad as it was, got me to that point. Mm -hmm. When I started doing um, classes for film and TV to learn about um, presence in the audition room. How do I audition? Mm -hmm. How do I act in front of the camera? There's so many rules and they don't tell you. Um, <laughs> so I spent quite a few years trying to learn those. Mm -hmm. That was when I started to reframe how I prepped for a role. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of it, you know, in theater, you have time. Yes. A lot of times you've already seen the show. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with it. You know that there's an audition coming up in six weeks. Film and TV, boom, boom, boom. Right. You have got to know it. 
And with my dyslexia and my learning disabilities, and also the bad habits that I taught myself in theater, mm. and the amount of time I took to do it because it was theater and I was, I was given that amount mm. of time, um, I found it really, really hard to actually prep in a good way for any audition, any class. Um, actually, filming was a lot easier because you do have more time. Um, so what I ended up doing was figuring out my, my own method again, um, mm -hmm. using more scientific methods. Mm -hmm. um, I do, I, um, I have a coach for okay. my dyslexia specifically okay. to help me read scripts with my mm -hmm. dyslexia, and he has given me a lot of um, tips. But really what it comes down to is relaxation, mm -hmm. not having pressure, because what that does to the brain is completely wipes out any type of memorization that you can have mm -hmm. that's quality or worth your time. Um, and working on comprehension. Comprehension is really the number one thing, I think. You can memorize and memorize and memorize, but if you don't comprehend what's going on, mm -hmm. the memorization really doesn't serve you that well, in my opinion. So if you approach it from a comprehensive comprehensive comprehension standpoint, yes. it actually helps you memorize along the way. Uh -huh. um, so memorizing becomes a very secondary thing, and that wasn't what it was for me in the beginning. Oh, interesting. So I really, yeah, I focus on comprehension um, and still allowing the, the characters to show themselves to me, um, but it's just in a different way. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, if you haven't touched on it yet, I said, do you have career goals still? Yes. What are your, <laughs> give us a few of those career goals, why don't oh, you? Oh, my goodness. Well, um, success for any actor, I think, is different. A lot of times when people find out I'm an actor, um, they go, ooh, well, what have you been in that I've seen? Or um, you want to be famous, don't you? Uh, and those, those are not really my goals. Um, success for me is being not having to audition as much, you okay. know, having people reach out to me and say, hey, I think you'd be really great for this role. Would you like to, to play it? Um, and I've already been experiencing that mm, quite, quite often, yes. Yeah. And so in a way, those goals have already been met, but for them to continue, they're also future goals. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, fame is not... Uh, the end all for me and yeah. if it was I think I'd be quite shy about it actually um, but really just having people bring roles to me and, and ha I can just pick and choose what I want absolutely that that of would course. be great so that's a definite huge goal for me to continue right. to have um, uh, walking the red carpet at can was, was a life goal that was big, and it? it happened and you did it already yeah <laughs> but uh, there's always next year you know uh, going to the mm -hmm. Oscars Oh, I would love to get an Oscar. Who wouldn't, right? <laughs> um, but that's definitely a goal for me. Um, even if you know it, the celebrities that I, I really prize and I really enjoy are the ones that are not in the spotlight. Mm. I, Kate Winslet, Kate Blanchett, Eddie Redmayne, mm. so many others. They're they're good and they're mm. there because they're good, you mm. know. And then whatever they do with the rest of their time, volunteering. Mm -hmm. chilling out they don't need to be all over the tabloids mm -hmm. that that's that's another goal for me right. is if i ever did okay. win an oscar okay i would not be hounded by the paparazzi i know Great. this is like way out of my league this goal <laughs> <laughs> but why not dream you know. but yeah but actually you know you the solution is you write and direct a movie mm -hmm. and you give yourself a part yes <laughs> You Absolutely. write a part in it for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to do it. Now, yeah. when you talk about people doing other things, before we end, I want to get into about your charity. Sure. Because Parties. Yes. Talk about that and what okay. that is. Uh, so Because Parties is um, a nonprofit that I founded, uh, and it, it's to offer birthday parties to un underprivileged kids. Um, Baltimore is a really rough city, mm -hmm. uh, especially for the youth. Mm -hmm. And a lot of youth, uh, I think it was 13,000 was, was the number mm -hmm. um, a few years ago of uh, kids that don't get a birthday party every year. Wow. And 
birthday parties to me are a celebration of your existence. Mm -hmm. So if you're not having someone celebrate your existence as a child, mm -hmm. that's telling you something. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you know it or not, it's, it's shaping who you are. And so to receive a birthday party says everything. It, mm -hmm. it says, I see you, I love you, you matter. Um, and I'm not saying that people that can't afford to have a party don't show their children that on a daily basis. Right. They absolutely do. Uh, but when you see other people having birthday parties and you're not receiving that, that can just take a toll, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm working towards getting my first birthday party. I've raised money for that. I'm oh, still good. working on raising money for that. Um, and I'm working towards getting my, my first kid for my mm -hmm. first birthday party coming up hopefully in the fall. Terrific. And hopefully people know about it and you yes. can have fundraisers and Absolutely. Things like that. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay. <laughs> and so what we want to do before we end is you look into your monitor over here and give people your contact information. How can okay. they find Vanessa Meadows and all the things she's done and are doing? Oh gosh. <laughs> okay. Well, my website is www.vanessameadows.com. You can also find me on Instagram. I believe it's Vanessa Meadows. Vanessa Meadows, I think is what it is. <laughs> uh, you can also find me on Facebook, Vanessa.C.Meadows or Vanessa C. Meadows. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> I wasn't really prepared, but feel free to find me, reach out, and I'd love to, uh, to meet you. <laughs> well, great. Well, again, it was great to have you back in here. I mean, Thank you're you. so busy, mm -hmm. but uh, just like you talked about those other people who are so busy all the time. Yes. <laughs> and so, but we caught up with you. Yeah. I patiently waited for you to when you were available, because <laughs> you were worth interviewing. Thank you yeah, so yeah. much. I really, really, I had a great time. Thank you. Yeah. And okay, folks, so unfortunately, it's the end of another program. I hope you really enjoyed this young woman, because we're going to hear great things from her, I believe. And so until next time, this is Paul Stefan saying good night. You're watching The Paul Stefan Show on TV Free Baltimore. The Despotier is on my shore, Maryland, my Maryland, his torch is at thy temple door, Maryland, my Maryland, avenge the patriotic glory. Streets of Baltimore and be the battle queen of York, Maryland, my Maryland. This concludes another day of live stream broadcasting from TV Free Baltimore.